Um, our next guest is uh, Miguel Robles Duran, uh, who is an urbanist and director of the Urban Ecologies graduate program in the New School Parsons in New York. And he's a senior fellow at the Civic City, a postgraduate design research program based in Head, Geneva, Switzerland, and a co-founder of Cohabitation Strategies, an international non-profit non -profit cooperative for social spatial development based in New York and Rotterdam. Uh, and um, uh, Miguel and I met at the conference in Warsaw when he, um, I, in, uh, in fall last year, um, uh, was introducing the special organization of Occupy Wall Street movement, and this is how, um, this is how we met, and it was uh, uh, still during this most enthusiastic period of, of the movement being present out there on the streets uh, of the New York City. And then I asked Miguel to, Miguel to come back to, to that talk, but also from the today's perspective. So what happened, what the movement produced, how it continues, what kind of possibilities it creates, and what kind of, form, what kind of forms of organization grew out of this. Please welcome Miguel Robles Duran. Thank you very much, uh, Aneta. It's uh, always great to be back in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Gabriel, also thank you very much. Uh, it is also, as with uh, Irit, my first time um, at this academy. Always like legendary, in a way, sounding uh, the name all over the place. And uh, it's very interesting to be here in this environment. Um, today I'm going to be um, discussing uh, sort of two, a two-part lecture. On one side, I would like to approximate my lecture towards um, the type of practice that I do, which, uh, as already Aneta mentioned, I'm a practicing urbanist, and like part-time academic, part-time urbanist. Um, and uh, in the other hand, I also will be approaching from this lecture from within the Occupy Wall Street movement until last Saturday, which is the last time I met with them. Um, I will be representing also uh, two organizations. On one hand, exploitation strategies, which it's a lot of the thinking that we get to do on these issues come from a discussion from my partners in, in this cooperative, Emiliano Gandolfi, Lucia Babina, Gabriela Rendon, Thomas Purcell, and myself. And on the other hand, of course, uh, the new school, which I've been trying to develop a new graduate urban program that addresses uh, the issues that are going to be discussing today, and which I'm extremely grateful just for them to be able to receive this direction in a graduate program, which I think is quite relevant because the issue of education will come um, often in, the, uh, in my presentation. Um, the title of, to, of the lecture today, it's, uh, I titled it The Anatomy of an Urban Crisis. Of course, I mean, it would take much longer than just this lecture uh, to create an anatomy, but I want to approach this uh, moment as a moment of an urban crisis. On one hand, because I'm, of course, a practicing urbanist, but on the other hand, it's just another way of trying to look and see uh, what's going on around the world. So in this first part, I will be reading, and the second part, I will be improvising. So I need to be a little bit precise in the first part, so I ask you to, to uh, stick with me on this. Uh, we'll try to do it uh, slowly. And the second part will be much more improvising, so I hope that you um, enjoy it. So, sitting in front of the American Pavilion at the 2008 Venice Biennale of Architecture, resting from a hard day of work, a good friend of mine approached me, uh, agitated, out of breath. He looked right into my eyes and said, Miguel, it's finally happening. Lehman Brothers just went bankrupt. My immediate reply to his saying was, well, I hope this means no more exhibitions like the one at the Arsenale, which I'm not sure those of you that were there 
uh, would remember, but at the time, though, that exhibition represented the extreme of neoliberal architectural spectacle. A splurge of irrelevant shiny objects, over-designed and luxurious formal manifestations from the design elites, on display for the mainstream media, and a few high-end business people who could afford them in their collections, of course. But what did this financial collapse actually mean for spatial design art practices? In what way will spatial design art disciplines transform because of it? Beyond the obvious answers that normally begin with labor market projections of you guys are going to have less work, you're going to have less commissions, there's going to be less construction, and the typical imminent redundancies that everybody talks about, this collapse, in my opinion, was hinting at something much deeper and much rooted, a structural shift of epoch-making proportion. It began to evoke the possibility of transgression of something that was called, or that is still called, postmodernity. An era that, according to David Harvey, good colleague, urban colleague, said, concentrated upon the schizophrenic circumstances induced by fragmentation and all the instabilities that prevent us even picturing coherently, let alone devising strategies to produce some radically different future. Although addressing these structural shifts would require, of course, much more than these 45 minutes that I'm going to be talking, the first part of my presentation will attempt to raise relevant questions about the role of spatial design art disciplines. Um, it responds to the general direction that the urban development has taken since the beginning of the current global crisis. Utilizing Europe, this is, by the way, the Arsenale, um, uh, it's close to the Arsenal, utilizing Europe uh, to exemplify, exemplify how the economic overturn has been slowly repositioning the importance of spatial design, art, practices, and in which way the crisis has pushed the bifurcation of the classical disciplinary lines into the slow emergence of what I think is a new genus, still difficult to define, of radical urban practices. In December 17, 2010, the European Commission demanded to know why a 16 million euro concert hall built and designed the coastal region around Naples by Oscar Niemeyer, this famous Brazilian architect, was not in use. Since its construction approval in 2006, the project had costed approximately 8 million euros to the European taxpayer, and now Europe was looking to get its money back. On May 3rd, 2011, the Spanish housing minister, Beatriz Corredor, together with the public works minister, Jose Blanco, began a six-nation tour aimed at encouraging richer European citizens, especially from the north, to buy one or more of the estimated three million empty houses in Spain. In October 23, 2011, the U.S. bank BNY Mellon, together with five other investors, were close to buying a Bank of Ireland's headquarters buildings for five million euros once seen as a symbolic flagship of the International Financial Service Center. It sits at the core of the now lifeless 500 hectare urban redevelopment of Dublin's Docklands, itself a clear model of the European Union's new urban policy for the promotion of large-scale urban development projects. Now, these are just three examples of the thousands more that typify the political economic climate of the current economic crisis. For a little more than two decades, neoliberal urbanization in Europe, together with most of the world, had gone full speed. European development credits and subsidies were funding an unprecedented urban and territorial restructuring, while the finance and property complex underwent a radical transformation. From excuses uh, for Olympics to fabricated cultural needs, from new housing standards to creative class desires, from public art, stadiums, museums, hip-hop housing quarters, Hip housing quarters, sorry. The tourist resorts, <laughs> cheap, I'm kind of hip hopping here. Uh, cheap master plans, high tech bridges, all the way to computer controlled roads. Europe was concentrating a large part of its new financially produced fictitious capital in physical space, promoted, of course, by the European Union banks. All of this was designed to foster interurban competition and propel the financial and legal restructuring produced by the speculative nature of economic growth. A new Euro European economic policy that promoted financial deregulation, privatization, flexibilization of labor market, and spatial decentralization emerged side by side with a new European urban policy, 
which focus on building attractive spaces for luring foreign and direct, inve foreign direct investment and the driving on financialized urban development through a series of strategic policy instruments such as city branding, which artists had a big role in it, still have, public-private partnerships, privatization, state entrepreneurialism, targeted subsidies, and the like. These were the main factors that conditioned special design practices, producing the rapid rise of superstar curators, boutique architects, urban design firms, art collectives, creative think tanks, and all kinds of designers that artists com uh, were competing for a role on re-envisioning the city in what another friend, Eric Swinghedo, dubbed an elite playing field where the main aspiration in these past years was to turn the city into a global competitive actor in the domain in which the elites felt it had some competitive advantage. The great majority of the design art practices that seemingly emerged triumphant from this neoliberal period were correspondingly transformed by the corporate-driven logic of its clients, owing most of their success to the spectacular and blind representations of speculative free market ideals. As financial analysts Gutzman and Newman denote, more than an architectural or art movement, the things we see today around us are largely the manifestation of a widespread financial phenomenon. The speculative strategies of capitalist development are changing radically. And together with this change, the treacherous and exploitative model of urbanization that we all have experienced during the last two decades is also seemingly dissolving into unknown forms. Under these circumstances, there is one relevant question that I believe us urbanites should be asking. What will be the coming transition? What will the coming transition produce in our cities? And what, what will it demand from their producers? And that includes all of you here. The outlook is, I think, grim as the crisis itself. One thing is for certain, that type of spatial art practice is finally ruptured on a global scale. Thick books, creative class paraphernalia, fashionable biennales, star architects, star artists, techno-formal obsessions, luxury ecological eco projects, wallpapered media, shiny academics. It seems that they are no longer needed in this crisis. Certainly not at the magnitude that they were a few years back. The neoliberal system as we know it, which sustains such practices, has collapsed in some form. Mike Davis summarizes this condition well. What was inconceivable just a year ago, even to most Marxists, that Davis says, is now a specter haunting the opinion pages of business press, the imminent destruction of much of the institutional framework of globalization, and undermining of the post-1989 international order. As I give my presentation here, the majority of the developed world is envisioning, in one way or another, a new economic plan of action. In the most troubled continent, Europe, a new economic policy is being drafted, undoubtedly directing a new urban policy which will translate to radical social, political, and environmental shifts. By now, most of the EU states have given up their sovereignty by undemocratically surrendering control of their monetary policy and dismantling their social securities in favor of balancing spiraling debt. As if this was not enough punishment for all of us citizens, the debtor countries are now being asked to accept a permanent Franco-German veto over budgets and public spending. I guess this might, might translate to no more signature museums or nice public art pieces in the South, but also no more needed social infrastructure. The urban implications of such a structural economic shift are not that difficult to predict, as it appears that the ideological base of its promoters remains intact. Good old neoliberalism, but this time in a legal totalitarian form manicured as, prudent plan, as a prudent plan to enact urgent austerity measures. An austere neoliberalism might sound oxymoronic, but reflecting on its core principles, what it does is that it renders a streamlined and more efficient operative form that can continue to mobilize capital without, without all the non-productive social expenditures, cumbersome citizen rights, and other legalities. The common neoliberal direction towards slashing social spending is to be expected in greater magnitude. Amsterdam and London, I think, are two great examples of so, a lot of them on how these new policies are reshaping the political imagination of the urban realm. 
November 6, 2011, Amsterdam revealed its austere spending intentions to cut cultural and social programs such as job assistance, language courses, social assistance, benefits, and anti-poverty anti measures by 140 million euros, while boosting by more than 100 million euros its infrastructure building program, which includes a continuation of a heavily state-subsidized white elephant from the previous economic regime, the famous North and South Metro Line. The line was to be inaugurated in 2011, as many of you know, at an original cost of 1.46 billion euros, and now has been reprogrammed for a 2017 deadline at a taxpayer cost of an additional 1.7 billion euros. According to the Parole journalist Bas uh, Sutenhorst, costs have exploded partially because the municipality allowed itself to be fleeced by private contractors. On December 5, 2011, outside of the Eurozone, the, Prime Minister intervened, the British Prime Minister intervened in the budgets of London's 2012 Olympic Games, authorizing the doubling of the opening ceremony cost to 81 million pounds, an extra 271 million pounds for security spending, to be achieved primarily by a great contribution, of course, of taxpayers. I quote, this is a moment when the eyes of the world will be looking at us. It is absolutely incumbent on us, in government, to maximize the opportunity to drive the maximum benefit for the economy and for tourism. This is what they said, argued this guy, the sports minister, Hugh Robertson. The better the show, the bigger the return on the investment, I guess. The question here is an investment return to whom? This announcement appears at a time when the city of London and Great Britain in general brace for dramatic austerity cuts on sports, education, and cultural and social programs. That is 19% of cuts, to be precise. The largest since the Great Depression. Not to mention cuts in other types of government spending, like the redundancy of 16,200 police officers across the country, but of course hiring private security firms to take care of the Olympics. As part of this welfare reform bill, which will affect the one-fifth one of Londoners who still live in some form of social housing. I could talk about many more examples, from the Catalonian, Catalonian austerity measures to Mario Monti's plans for Italy. They all seem to have the same common denominators, cutting and reducing salaries of public employees, cutting and raising cost of education, culture, health, and other public services, less tax credits, and more privatization, of course. In contrast, all these measures come together with a peculiar spending support for long-standing capital projects where large public investment or public-private investment is at stake, where they are of an infrastructural, touristic, or pure real estate denomination. These are spaces that will dominate the building of a brand new urban world, and perhaps a few of the award-winning corporate-friendly design and artist firms which might survive to fabricate that public image. So, while most of the urban investment on in this shape or this part of austere neoliberalism will unevenly target selected capital projects, most of the new forms of urbanization, and this is what I come here to argue, will be fought and it's being produced in the streets. Here, I am hinting at the inevitable formation of some form of parallel urban world. What was imagined at some point by cyberpunk novelists more than 20 years ago is now becoming a palpable reality. An urban world with parallel economies, on-the-ground exchanges, solidarities, collective services, alternative housing models, cooperative factories, localized agricultures, and alternative pedagogical structures are produced by the people. And all of this will occur inside and side to side with a gigantic, more unified Orwellian government apparatus that aims to control urban processes for the sake of sustaining the large mobility of capital that is required for the reproduction of the evolved financial system. My point of view, the coming of age as represented in the spectacular urban accumulations of private capital surplus and the material efforts of nation branding have reached their limits as they expose and contrast between the minor concentrations of wealth in the city and the massive dilution of poverty of its surrounding territory we must then come to terms to the West, that the Western hegemonic project, where the state provided, planned, controlled, and defined the models of urbanization for all citizens to follow, 
in my opinion, has reached its tipping point. I can no longer imagine a future that comes out of this tradition, nor can I think many of us foresee a change within that old project, even though this is the direction, the direction that the European Union, the United States, um, and all these governments have been working for. Western governments have gone, and this I quote, as far as possible in externalizing the cost of urban and environmental degradation, social reproduction. This is David Harvey talking. The assault on the environment and the well-being of its people is palpable, and it's taking place for political and class, and not for economic reasons. The only question is, and this David Harvey asks, when will the people start to wage class war back? In 2010, um, many of us began to wage organized class war. It is a frighteningly long road to reach the starting points of earlier attempts to build a new world, Davis, Mike Davis argues. But he also says, a new generation at least has bravely initiated this journey. And now, what is to be done by us that practice outside? This December 17th uh, marked one year anniversary of Mohammed Bozazi Wazizi setting himself on fire in a desperate act of protest. A human spark that triggered a world uprising of historical proportion. In different forms, Icelanders, Tunisians, Egyptians, Libyans, Syrians, Greeks, Spanish, Italians, British, Americans, Russians, to mention a few, have taken to the streets with numerous, in numerous itinerant mass civilian mobilizations against the apparatus and the global economic catastrophe it produced, declaring the urban realm as its field of action. Meanwhile, oblivious to this social turmoil, at least in the last two years, it appears that most of the creative establishment continues to operate at the request of the predatory market system that produced the crisis. Browsing in recent mainstream books, magazines, exhibitions about creative practices, one cannot help to be surprised as the general lack of political engagement of its content. The global crisis is portrayed as a hiccup in the otherwise business as usual practice. Architects discuss irrelevant form making and high profile competitions. Artists continue to fill up biennales with decorative presentations. Product designers win awards for unnecessary expensive objects. And so called critics write inconsequential snobberies for the reader's entertainment that should last until next month's edition. Further supporting this argument, the academic establishment of the creatives, propelled by its many representatives, the forefront commanders, generators of the new, predictors of the trend, the in, the next, gurus of the discipline, foreseers of the hip and the cheek. Representatives, these representatives continue to promote technological obsessions, style and form-driven representations all the while pursuing a postmodern professional practice based on seeking limited design commissions, hoping to win a competition here and there, and further narrowing an already deterministic craft for the efficient execution at the market demand. But hidden beneath these dec decades of market-driven design practices, I believe that another way of practicing is the finally emerging as part of this global uprise. From the leading death ruins of postmodernity, small groups of radical urban practices which for years have managed to resist and operate outside the crisp disciplinary boundaries occupied by capitalism, have slowly begun to collectively envision the organizational and material form of this brand new parallel urban world. This points to a new kind of paradigm, the bifurcation of centuries-old disciplinary lines one that will undoubtedly continue to demand classical practitioners to fulfill the representational needs and wants of capitalism, but another that will construct a very different type of transdisciplinary practice concerned with the production of a new parallel urban world. Now, this I, I, I start uh, discussing the second part of my presentation, which deals more with my engagement uh, in the Occupy Wall Street movement, as thousands of us have. Um, and I should, before, uh, before I begin, I should present to you this text that is uh, behind me. Uh, this was written by Fernando, a member of uh, the one of the committees I belong to. 
and he goes by saying this, our movement is not an anonymous movement. On the contrary, it is conformed by a multiplicity of voices, singularities, and names. Anybody can talk from the movement, but not on behalf of the movement. And I, wanna, I put this because I want that to be very clear. Anybody can participate in the movement, but not represent the movement. So I'm not here representing Occupy Wall Street. We organize ourselves as a movement. We express ourselves as individuals. I want to go by um, uh, slowly to uh, the things that, that were assembled, the texts that were assembled immediately after the first occupation on the 17th of September uh, last year, um, which were things that still uh, resonate with us uh, quite a lot. Um, please try to read it with me. Um, they say, they have turned our homes into pure fictitious capital, a speculative instrument made for the market and hardly for living. They have taken bailouts from taxpayers with impunity and continue to do so outside any democratic frame. They have perpetuated inequality and discrimination in the workplace based on age, the color of one's skin, sex, gender, identity, and sexual orientation. They have poisoned the food supply through negligence and undermined the farming system through monopolization. They have continuously sought to stop employees of the right to negotiate for better pay and safer working conditions. They have held students hostage in debt and mediocre knowledge. They have consistently outsourced labor, used that outsourcing as leverage to cut workers' benefits and pay. They have influenced the courts, the courts to achieve the same rights as people with none of the culpability or responsibility. They have privatized our health. They have sold our privacy as a commodity. They have used force to prevent real freedom of the press. They undemocratically determine economic policy despite the catastrophic failures that their policies have produced and continue to produce. They have donated large sums of money to politicians who are responsible to re of regulating them. They continue to block alternate, alternative forms of energy to keep us dependent on oil. They continue to block generic forms of medicine that could save people's lives and provide relief in order to protect investments that have already turned into substantial profits. They have purposefully covered up oil spills, accidents, faulty bookkeeping, and inactive ingredients in pursuits of profit. They purposefully keep people misinformed and fearful to their control of the media. They have perpetuated colonialism at home and abroad. They have participated in torture and murder of innocent civilians overseas. They continue to support international forces that submit other states to their playful will. They have transformed our cities in their own image and profitable will. Stockholm, Rome, Toronto, Chicago. City people work harder, make more money, and attract more investment than the dwindling numbers who live outside of them. In Italy, for example, the single city of Milan represents 40% of the national economy. Cities pull in the young and the highly skilled, and when they bring businesses and universities together, they spark innovation, most of the time. The OECD has been studying 78 cities around the world and has found a link between the success of a city and its size. There is a positive correlation between size and income. However, when these cities become mega cities, with um, having a population of more than 7 million inhabitants, this correlation becomes negative due to many factors, including essentially congestion costs, um, pollution, too many people, problem of transport, and so on. But if they solve the problems with new transport systems, for example, cities can keep getting bigger, richer, and more powerful. Competition between cities is getting as sharp as the competition between nations, and successful old world cities like Helsinki and Barcelona are facing a new challenge from the east, from Hyderabad and Shanghai. How to keep their advantage is really to constantly innovate, to um, implement policy that will, for instance, uh, increase the leakages between firms and uh, universities, and also if you want to attract people, you need to provide an attractive environment. Think of the competition to host the Olympic Games, but for investment, tourists, 
and the brain power of an increasingly mobile global workforce. A fight fought with gardens, architecture, sleek new transport systems, modern art museums. It should mean that the most competitive cities of the future will also be the most agreeable to live in. John Lawrenson, OECD TV, Paris. Now, the most agreeable to live in for whom? That's the big question. Uh, what you saw here, it's a video from the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is one uh, subsidiary of uh, World, World Bank uh, um, that uh, consults cities all over the world and has been consulting unquestionably the Netherlands and, and two of its cities um, in order how to continue in this regime of interurban competition. Um, this um, produces, of course, uh, a request, a requirement for the majority of us to engage in what they call constant innovation, as you saw there. Now, the slide that you see here on the back, it's a, a very interesting study that was made by some Zurich scientist, uh, Swiss, Swiss scientist, non-political, about sort of how concentrated is capital um, in these different sort of corporations around the world. What they wanted to say is, or what they wanted to do is basically have a to uh, um, something quite clear about what this 1% actually meant. Uh, what they came up being, they discovered that 40 companies uh, around the world uh, control 40% of the world's global output. That's enormous. Now, most of these companies, the ones you see here on uh, blue, are European companies. The ones you see on orange are Dutch companies that are part of these uh, top 40 uh, sort of global multinationals. What I want to say with this thing is that we're not talking about an American condition here. We're talking about a global condition where America permits things to appear, but the people behind it uh, are from all over the place. So it's pretty much also a European crisis, although you have felt it appeared less, but uh, not really so much less. Um, very briefly, I wanted to pass through to from what the OECD is requesting or requiring from all these cities. Um, this was uh, compiled in 2009 from a document where they were recommending cities to do this and this the other. And um, I'm going to read just a few numbers here. I, perhaps you can even read them. Um, it says, all countries must pursue competitiveness in global economy. I'm going to skip to uh, number, I would say, six. Um, beyond that, the governments must create and maintain a good climate for investment. It must provide, number seven, an abundant and productive labor force. Entrepreneurship, number nine, and innovation must be promoted at all levels. And number ten is my favorite, of course. I mean, there should be a particular focus on the empowerment of women. Um, and this refers to, of course, as women as labor force, which has not been a situation. As such, has nothing to do with feminism or pro-women pro, pro conditions. Now, this type of, of, of discussions that the OECD goes through and then provides to uh, different cities around the world produce a very specific type of image from the city. Now, this is an image that the last years have actually provided uh, of what our city is being built. You can go to South Axis. No, Quest, of course, is not these, but this is a good Photoshop of all of them together, right? Um, isolated, um, uh, creating their own world, you know, constructing on their own image, which is by no means my image of what this world should be. And then we are bombarded by other sort of images, you know, like this one uh, from Desite, um, which I love the sequence of these two. Well, this is, where once a crisis appears, uh, once a crisis comes into buy, then let's just, of course, constrain these banks. But that constraint actually means this. This is a, outside of the Chase Manhattan or the, the J.P. Morgan Chase headquarters in New York, where it is a public space, a heritage space, which up till today, it's been seen like this, of them being afraid of us now getting into their spaces. So you have um, around Wall Street, um, yes, they have been constrained, but they have been put more into this sort of guarantees and safeness of the situation. This is a very usual condition. This is nothing ex ex exceptional you know, of how the spaces right now all over Manhattan around, especially Sukoti Park and Wall Street, um, look now. Now, the situation that we're facing is the following. The top six banks in the U.S. currently hold assets equivalent to 65% of the U.S. GDP. The top 10 hedge fund managers in the U.S. Um, 
last year had a median income of $2 billion, median income. The productivity in the United States has almost quadrupled since 1980, yet wages, and that includes, of course, my wage, have remained almost completely flat. Interestingly enough, income from the top 1%, of course, has more than quadrupled. The top 1% in the USA have more wealth than the bottom 95% combined. The top 400 people in the US have more wealth than the bottom 150 million of the people combined. That's 400 wealthy individuals owning more than the bottom half of the entire country combined. Now, I should um, put you guys to refer a little bit back on that slide where I show you the different banks that, or corporations that, that had the biggest power in the, in the world. And um, one of the things that, that I think is very important to understand is that the United States, because of its forms of the regulation, provides that possibility. But that many of these banks that you see there are actually owned or partly owned by Europeans, Chinese, and Japanese. This is not an American situation, I should say. Here, the permission is not so, well, you know, depending, London is going different directions, the Netherlands also. But the situation right now allows for that the condition to happen in the United States. But it's a global condition. It's a capitalist condition. It is not a condition of America, of the United States. It's just what capitalism can do without sort of what it can do you know, in general. So um, I want to approach the issue of Occupy, which is what Amit asked me to, to talk about. I haven't talked uh, precisely about this organization form. Uh, but I needed to frame actually what, is, what was behind it, or at least me, that I'm part of this, uh, and I'm engaged uh, as much as I can um, in this. Um, what it actually pushed all these people to be part of it. And it's very clear that the situation is not, you know, it's not a nice situation, especially for us in the United States right now. No. It's actually very hard and difficult. You are faced every single day that you go out on the street with this polarity, with these disparities of classes. Um, and it is something that it just, you know, it needed a moment, and that was a moment. But it was nothing peculiar or special in that moment, per se. So far, we have 8,868 members. I looked at uh, in the morning uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, num this number. This means 8,868 active members in the organization. Now, what is very interesting about how the whole movement has been composed around is that the movement is really composed of labor, of, of labor workforces. It's not composed of you know, a bunch of people just going out in the street and committing. Actually, all these 8,868 members that you see there are working. Uh, they work, uh, I try to work as much as I can on a Saturday because that's the most I can do it. There are others that can actually do it more often. Um, and they're working towards certain projects. I'm going to try to show you two projects, but I want to give you a brief of what that means. Behind me, you have all these um, committees, uh, the think tank committee, which is responsible of the main direction of the organization. And you will see there that the second largest committee of all Occupy Wall Street is composed by arts and culture. Um, um, I am surprised, but I'm not surprised. No. Um, of course, there's incredible disparity within. You can imagine the types of dog fights and cat fights that happen within it. But nevertheless, there are uh, subcommittees and work groups that are producing very interesting projects in the city, all over the city, every single day, every week. Um, you have, of course, the internet groups, the politics and electoral forms. These are, we are right now 80 uh, committees, so these are just a, a few of them. And I have been actively participating in which, uh, which one is called Empowerment and Education Committee which uh, I think is very relevant to its uh, previous talk, and, uh, and the housing committee. Well, so that's mainly the organization. The way that the, the, the operation of functions here is uh, in this diagram, which is a very, very early diagram, but somehow it has remained, so it has mutated, but it's pretty much the same. It's a diagram I made of how, what was the operative form, how it was actually these, these sessions of organization. Uh, were happening and what was the system that allowed us not to have um, direct uh, representation in terms of leadership. And so what you see back here, let's say the, the inner circle is supposed to be empty. And all these cells that you see around are people that are grouped for each of these committees. Or in this case, this was the structure of a committee and all of these are people that are uh, organized in subcommittees. 
So you have the subcommittees of new projects, of open forum, which we were, we were responsible during the times of the occupation to bring speakers, kind of like Naomi Klein and, and these type of, of, of speakers, uh, just to bring some, some media attention there. Um, movement strategy, and then one of them that you will see there is called Nomadic University, which was, has mutated quite a lot afterwards. Now, the idea is that each member, every week, each group, each uh, subcommittee, um, selects two people to represent uh, in a rotational basis so that we cannot um, repeat ourselves or we cannot engage in this form of leadership that is very common in this type of groups. So far, I can really say I don't know who's the leader of anything. Actually, I hardly know uh, many of the people that are in the whole movement in other committees because it has really gotten to work in a very autonomous form but all of us seeking similar goals, which is a very interesting format as such. Um, and uh, the, the conditions where we meet is this. Um, this is a, a privately owned public space, very famous, perhaps you have read about it, but uh, the government um, of New York decided to privatize some public spaces, so they were sold, um, but with the condition that they should remain open for public. And this sort of... Um, legal condition or legal situation allowed the occupation to, to take Sukoti Park because Sukoti Park was a private space, but a public, privately owned public space, which uh, the law permitted us to actually occupy that space. If it was just a public public space, they could have kicked us out very easily. So uh, taking advantage of all these little things that capitalism has produced, it was very interesting. So this is one of them. This is a covered space. Of course, it's cold over there. So this is uh, sort of the organization of how, how we meet. And in general, um, the, the different events that happened within it, this was last Saturday, we had a, a very important conversation on what we call uh, Occupy University, which is what we've been development, developing, which is very funny that you know, Edith uh, sort of approached her lecture at the end with issues of, uh, how was it, Tenth University or such. Uh, in difference, I guess, to Tenth University, I don't know, I would like to ask Edith about it. Uh, we have been formalizing ourselves quite a lot. Um, formalizing, not in terms of creating an institution, but in terms of creating um, a very strong organization uh, that is supported by a lot of academics around New York, which basically go on this hands by saying, I teach in this university, I have a responsibility to teach somewhere else because the others cannot have access to what I teach. So um, under that idea, it's almost like a, a public university without government. Uh, this is uh, what David Backer, a guy working in there. And working on this idea, we've actually started to develop uh, different forms of, of curricula that I will show you around. I suggest that you go into our website, which is uh, university.nycga.net. Um, NYCGA, by the way, is the official website of Occupy Movement. It calls New York City General Assembly. That's, that's what it means. And uh, developing core curriculums of what we call a civic empowerment in this project. So you cannot read this, I, I think I even can't, but uh, on different conditions, what we have tried to do is work around, um, if we're going to discuss property, let's talk about things that they have not taught us in, in college or in high school or in any other uh, frame. Things that are considered outside of the general education like community land trust, affordable housing models, uh, about warehousing, about squatting, about conditions of gentrification, alternative finance models, if I go to economy, about trade deals, workers' cooperatives, um, economic solidarity, alternative currencies uh, in labor. We have unions, guilds, of course, cooperativism, mutualism, about capitalism, about democracy, about social movements, uh, about food, health, pedagogy, art, design, media environment, and so on and so on. So with this curriculum, uh, which is a flexible curriculum, well, we have been approaching a lot of people uh, in the ground uh, in New York. Uh, a lot of actually quite good academics have uh, agreed to teach at the university. And then we're setting some form of, of, of organization around that we organize through all of these. Um, I want to show you this. This is one of the, the, the part of the education thing, which is quite moving.
you please? And let me welcome, let me welcome as you do here. This could go for, for, for a long time, but um, what I, I think this is very exemplary of the type of um, protest, if one would say that's a protest, because I don't think it's a protest, it's about citizens trying to take back the power that they're supposed to have because they're the ones that are constructing our society. Um, they're not demanding things. I mean, this is one of the long-standing sort of the issues at the beginning of the, of the, of the movement. They are making things happen in some form. So what you saw now happens almost uh, every time the DOB Department, uh, Department of Education, DOE, uh, meets. Um, the same has happened to many uh, meetings uh, in the whole uh, New York uh, regarding, for example, housing, which is another uh, part that I've been uh, totally uh, as engaged as I can, um, where they're going there and they're stopping foreclosures. So, what this has allowed is, is it has brought back a certain sense of empowerment to people. Uh, to me, certainly, it has done that. Uh, and not to me as urbanist, academic, whatever, but to me as a general citizen of, of that city. 
Um, uh, not long ago, uh, I, was, uh, I was there in that um, so display here where we're talking about foreclosures. And they go uh, to, the, to the places where they auction the houses and they create all these type of spectacles. Basically what they do is they interrupt the situation and they don't know exactly what to do. Meanwhile, we have uh, legal teams that are fighting these things on the back uh, of lawyers that are offering themselves uh, to help um, alleviate all these situations. So there's a, a very incredible form of solidarity that has been uh, created since last uh, December, September that I have never ever felt in my life. Perhaps in my late uh, 30s I didn't have the opportunity to, to, to live other moments like this. Uh, but it's certainly incredibly exciting. So in difference that the movement is, a lot of people, you don't see a lot of it in the media anymore. It's because we're working uh, and the media is not interested in this working. I mean, they're interested in the spectacle. But we're working constantly in different groups um, all the time. So I think when this connects, and you're guessing, so how the hell does this connect to, to this issue of the urban I issue that I started with? And I want to end up with this. So it's like finally we can see uh, truly a new complex forms of urban knowledge are being assembled out of the activist experience of the numerous groups that now compose this global insurgency. Contrary to traditional specialized knowledge, where it's form, policy, housing, planning, uh, public artworks, etc., these groups are redefining urban practice in, in the indeterminate crossroads of different disciplinary lines blurring boundaries between the social sciences, social work, design, art, environmental sciences, and others. In these new assemblages, they have become relevant to understanding of an urban practice that is inscribed in the dynamic ecology it operates in, and to the search for a grassroots-led urban transformation. So I was telling you about this, that recently I was in Brooklyn taking part of this National Day of Action against foreclosures. A call made by the self-organization of various groups and committees that compose Occupy Wall Street movement. From the thousands that responded to the call, a very small percentage belonged professionally to the creative world. The majority were a mix of angry citizens from diverse fields and highly educated professionals from the social, political, and environmental sciences. What all of us had in common at that moment was a piercing desire to alter the repressive urbanization practices that had produced the city the majority of us live in, and in which the admired artist, curator, architect, planner, urbanist have been heavily contributing to. The parallel urban practices that are on the rise, I believe, share this anger and this desire. They also, sh they also share similarities in composition and action. All of them are hybrid practices that integrate multiple disciplines and sources of alternative knowledge, from street knowledge to social dynamics, urban policy to ecology. As collectives, they develop operative critiques of urban political economy, advocate for the right to the city, and experiment with non-speculative property systems, pedagogical models, and social spatial relations of production, to mention a few. These practices have recognized that a large part of the knowledge they acquired in their classical disciplinary training is overly deterministic, futile, and useless to actively respond to the urgent state of our urban condition. We have to understand that these new, these new forms of knowledge are needed to struggle against the social, financial, economic, and political dictates of capitalism and its main negotiators. The question, I guess, for you guys here is would you choose to continue to struggle in the diminishing industry of neoliberal representation? Or would you choose to help develop a new urban knowledge that our cities are crying for? With this, I want to conclude this prelude um, to all the non-conforming, critical, and disenchanted audience members of this auditorium. The theoretical distance produced inside the ivory towers of art or any form of creative black practice together with these small pockets of always glorious resistance and safe criticality that have dominated decades of endless manifesto concluding analysis is now irrelevant. The time has come, and this I tell to all, to dissolve our practices into the civic, to understand that a critical practice can only be achieved if it redefines itself 
inside the active dimensions of these larger urban, urban movements. Colet 15M, Occupy Wall Street Indignados, the Arab Spring, Democracia Real, yeah, and others that are existing. There are all these groups that are waiting for us to take part of this and reach the active construction of other possibilities of structural change. The time has come to get our hands in the dirt of all that has been left behind by neoliberalism. Guys, it's not about art, urbanism, geography, sociology. We must struggle to destroy centuries-old disciplinary silos, merge them in the dynamic ecological totality of civic action and into our precarious daily lives. Only then, I think, we might be able to conceive a critical practice after all of this. Um, thank you very much.